Anti-war protesters with the organization Code Pink are accusing independent senator from Vermont Bernie Sanders of having them arrested after they staged a demonstration inside his Senate office yesterday. Approximately 11 protesters were handcuffed and led away by Capitol Police yesterday after holding signs emblazoned with Sanders' own previous anti-war sentiments. Friend of the show, Sabrina Salvati, weighed in on the crackdown, tweeting, quote, Bernie Sanders owes everyone a refund. He should be ashamed of himself. Instead of facing those who supported his campaigns, he calls the cops on them. Now, over on the other side of the aisle, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene weighed in, too, tweeting, The war in Ukraine must end. Today, I met brave Code Pink activists who protested for peace in Bernie Sanders' office. Peace and free speech shouldn't be a partisan issue. We don't agree on most things, but we do agree Congress should stop fueling the war in Ukraine. While anti-war advocates may be lauding MTG for her show of unity against the pro-war state, you may remember that back when we talked to her here on Rising, I asked the Congresswoman directly if she actually supported cutting military spending, and here is what she had to say. Um, number one, I don't want to cut United States military spending. I want to stop all of the money being spent in the proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. I believe that's where the American people can save a lot of money. So this this ended up being an entire mess uh, on the internet. Uh, Mehdi Hassan took the photograph of uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene standing with the Code Pink activist and was very critical of Code Pink, basically saying this is like a red brown alliance, you can't trust these people. Code Pink immediately responded on Twitter saying that these were just some activists who were approached opportunistically. I think that's the word they used by Marjorie Taylor Greene. They didn't know what to do. They immediately contacted, you know, the leadership who, you know, told them, you know, don't talk to her, but it was too late. Um, and that they don't see there to be a lot of unity of interest there. Although on the narrow issue of Ukraine, I think there is unity of interest. And friend of the show, Max Blumenthal, tweeted out that it was a good thing that you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is even willing to perhaps cross the aisle, whichever way you want to see it, and come together on this issue of funding to Ukraine. And I agree with that, but I do think it's really worth noting how she responded to a question about what the military budget should actually be, whether you're actually willing to cut it, or if this is a very narrow criticism of a war that in many ways has been branded, not wrongly, but been branded as Biden's war. And some Republicans, I think, are opposing it, not because they have any real anti-war bona fides, right. but because it's a way to ding Biden. And can you really trust bedfellows like that as real allies going forward into a substantive anti-war movement that's able to mobilize the public and get real dividends? Yeah, I, it's very interesting to see Code Pink being, you know, sort of welcomed mm -hmm. Marjorie Taylor Greene's office to have a conversation and then being, you know, arrested in Bernie Sanders' office. It shows sort of how fractured and weird, like you were talking about bedfellows, like very strange bedfellows in this current political climate. And again, I think it's along very narrow lines. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and a lot of Republicans uh, sort of feel that again, like we were talking about in that poll in the previous segment or two ago, that the American people are not necessarily supportive of this, what looks like it may be shaping up to be a so-called endless war, yeah. uh, which is something that obviously the American people were not in support of when it came to Afghanistan, came to Iraq, things like that. I do think uh, that Again, this is just partisan differences, but Republicans still, even though a lot of them may say that the party has moved on from Ronald Reagan, a lot of them do still adhere to the idea of peace through strength. And for them, that means preventing war, means acting like you're going into World War III. Mm -hmm. um, and that means ramping up your production of everything, ramping up research and development, making sure that we have the best weapons in the world that can reach out and touch people anywhere in the world for basically any reason at any time. That obviously is not in line with what Code Pink wants. Um, I'm old enough to remember being at d events and debates in DC where Code Pink would show up to protest Dick Cheney with pink fuzzy handcuffs, yelling that Dick Cheney is a war criminal. Uh, and so obviously the, the kind of spending that a lot of Republicans still want on defense is something Code Pink isn't in line with. But in this idea that we don't want to get into an endless war in Ukraine is aligned, I think, with Republicans wanting to ramp up domestic defense spending because in their agenda, it's all about peace through strength. And in order to prevent a war, to dissuade China from taking Taiwan, to dissuade North Korea, Korea, things like this. We need to have the best weaponry and the best fighting force in the world with the intention and the hope that we never actually have to use it. It doesn't look like it, but that's kind of the, the idea behind peace through strength. Uh, yeah. I, it's also worth noting that given the fact, the fraction of the Republican Party over Ukraine between the um, 
the rebe re rebels, is I guess, I guess what we're sure, calling yes. them, <laughs> and the rest, the isn't exactly over these same Freedom Caucus lines, because Marjorie no. Taylor Greene was and I believe continues to be a Kevin McCarthy supporter. When they were going through those consecutive rounds of voting back in January, mm -hmm. she was one of the people who was rallying to side with Kevin McCarthy, who, of course, in the context of this most recent debate, is being painted as the pro-Ukraine mm -hmm. spending quantity. So again, all of this is getting very messy and confused, and it does start to feel, I think, to people like the Code Pink activists who've been doing this uh, work for 20 years, who were formed in the frustrations of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, to have that, those kind of credentials and then to have kind of Johnny come lately who can't even seem to keep their story straight over like a six-month cycle. It's, it's got to be frustrating. It's got to be disorienting. And I understand wanting to take a W, wanting just to accept help from a Congress member who wants help. And I do believe if we're talking about actual votes or trying to put forward legislation, 100 percent, they should just take the W. And if Marjorie Taylor Greene wants to sign on to something that's an anti-war project, that should be welcomed. But that's a very different thing than I think kind of symbolically or more holistically embracing someone who has is not an anti-war person. You, you heard it in the clip right there. She wants, and there's a, a longer version, there's a little bit more after that answer, which she, she says she wants, she wants us to have the strongest military in the world. She wants to fund the strongest military in the world. That is antithetical completely to Code Pink's agenda. Completely. Now, we, sh we shouldn't skip over the Bernie Sanders of this all, mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, regardless of how much of a bad faith actor Marjorie Taylor Greene may or may not be, Bernie Sanders was perceived to be the best of faith actors in Congress. High approval ratings, well trusted, a 40 year track record of consistent advocacy for things and positions that are hard to take, um, taking those positions back before they were popular, doing the work to make them popular, including when it comes to foreign policy. And I, I don't think it was literally, you know, who knows, but I don't think the impression here should be that Bernie Sanders was like sitting in the back room calling the police, <laughs> literally, but they were in his office and his yeah. staff chose to have them removed. What stark contrast that is yeah. to what happened when, say, AOC sat down even in Nancy Pelosi's office mm -hmm. with those climate protesters on the first day of, of her in office back in 2019. I don't recall the police being called. I believe, I was there, I was, I was covering it for The Intercept. They were sitting there and then eventually they left. Mm -hmm. That's much better optics. I don't know if Nancy Pelosi is just savvy or her, first, her staff is smarter or if she was in her hideaway room that is now, <laughs> she's now being kicked Cleaned out. Cleaned out, yeah. <laughs> so no she didn't more. care if she could get back into her office or not. Yeah. But this is just undoubtedly a bad look for Bernie Sanders. Oh, completely. And I, I think it sort of maybe goes to show how fighting in the trenches for a cause after so many years just kind of wears you down. You know, like AOC was literally like fresh off this yeah. upset election, taking down, you know, an incumbent who'd been there forever within her own party. She's got all this energy. She's ready to fight. Compared to, as you were pointing out, Senator Sanders, who's been there for decades, he's like, look, I've seen enough. I'm done with this. And again, I don't think he was commanding Capitol Police from a yeah. hidden closet in his office to get them out of there. But I do think it illuminates, in a way, some of, you were talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene's good or bad faith arguments. And I think it does point to her being more ideologically consistent on this, because she is very much in that Trump uh, sort of America first band of legislators who, again, would oppose the Ukraine funding because why are we doing that whenever we have things we need to address here at home, whether you agree that the United States can do two things at once, which a lot of or people do believe it can. Or is she going to vote to address those things at home? Is she going to support funding to address those things at home? Address, you mean the border and things like that? Well, or I, well, yes and no. That's funny. I wasn't thinking about the border. I was thinking about uh, fentanyl crisis, healthcare crisis, deaths of despair, uh, uh, the life expectancy falling mm -hmm. uh, for the first time uh, for white Americans, um, inflation, cost of living, housing costs is being up thirty, cost being up thirty percent in the last uh, few years, things like that. Yeah, I mean it. It's in a weird place where, again, like you pointed out, she was in that McCarthy defense camp. I mean, just mm -hmm. this week, she was she released a very lengthy thread on X uh, talking about why the motion to vacate was not the right thing mm -hmm. to do, and also the idea of expelling Gates was not the right thing mm -hmm. to do. And she kind of tried to work a position there in the middle, uh, and I don't know which side she now falls to. You know, obviously McCarthy's gone, so she can't really fall that way because he's not in a place to defend her anymore. Um, but it will be interesting to see how 
she plays that going forward. And I think, I mean, that's going to end up, I think, being one of the biggest questions in the speaker's race that's going to play out next week and will probably be very painful for all sides is going to be what is your position on Ukraine funding? Because mm-hmm. already uh, Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan was being asked about that and sort of giving... I don't know if they were truly different answers, but different sounding answers, depending on who he was speaking to and who the question was coming from. And I think that's going to turn out to be maybe the most defining thing, which is kind of crazy to me because most uh, heading into you know the midterms and after Biden first took office, everything was about, will you stop the Biden administration? Will you push back on this? Will you dismantle the administrative state? Will you dis, uh, defund all these Biden administration programs and stop this green energy transition and all these things? And for all of that to be potentially brushed aside or at least pushed underneath this idea of, will you continue voting to fund Ukraine as the number one issue of who is leading the House of Representatives is a wild, wild shift. And that's why force the vote works, because it forces everyone in Congress, at least anyone who wants a leadership position or wants to have Mm -hmm. a say, to be very clear on the record how they feel about an issue that's a high priority to the American people. It's literally why force the vote works. All right. Stick around. We'll have more rising for you right after this. Mm 